Good evening. It's quite loud, isn't it? Is that loud? Happy New Year to you all. If you were allowed to say Happy New Year on the 10th of January. Uh, It honestly is a a huge pleasure of mine to be here. I'm a huge fan of what Action for Happiness are trying to do, what they're trying to create. And I very much see what I'm doing, very much aligned actually with what Mark and, and, and this charity is trying to promote. And, you know... Action for happiness. I think health is a critical component of happiness. So many people I see day in, day out in my practice, you know, they don't feel good. That's impacting their relationship with their wives, with their partners, with their kids, with their work colleagues. And often I feel, and this is over 16 and a half years, I've seen tens of thousands of patients often I feel that it's actually their health and the fact that they're not feeling good about themselves is actually impacting the way that they're reacting and interacting with other people. So I think health is absolutely necessary in order to be happy, or it certainly helps. And I, on a wider level, and I think this is very much aligned with Action for Happiness, I think that as a society, when we are healthier, I think we're happier... And fundamentally, it comes down to the fact that when we feel better, we live more. Would anyone disagree with that? But there's many ways to get healthy. And the problem now in 2018, the way I see it, is that health has become incredibly complicated. And my goal with what I do on the television, what I do day in, day out with my patients, but also what I do in my new book is I try and simplify health because it doesn't need to be that hard and it really isn't that hard. At this time of year, in January, people are trying to lose weight. We're looking for the latest quick fix that's going to help us. You know, what's the magic diet that that we've never found so far that's suddenly going to work this January that's never worked before? Who's on a health kick at the moment? Yeah, a lot of people. I guess I am a little bit as well. I may share some of that later. (laughs) But we become too reductionist about health. We think it's about that magic diet or which workout regime this year is going to help us. But it's so much more than that. And the four factors that we have the most control over, that have the most impact on the way that we feel, are food and movement, which you've heard about before many times, but equally important, asleep and relaxation. And what I try to do in this book, which I've got to tell you, when I was sharing what I'm grateful for and what I feel pretty happy about at the moment, my book's only been out not even two weeks. It already hit number one on Amazon as a best-selling book. It's doing incredibly well. I'm shocked with how well it's doing. And I tell you, I had no plans when I qualified for medical school 16 and a half years ago to either be a TV doctor or a best-selling author. There was no master plan for this to happen. I just had a passion then that burns as strong as ever to help people. And I think, you know, if I tell you honestly that as a GP a few years ago, I reflected after a day's practice And I honestly felt that I only really helped 20% of my patients. I thought, sure, you know, I've given out a load of prescriptions. I've just about managed my workload through the day. But did I really help people? No. I think most doctors, in my opinion, if we're truly honest, particularly in general practice, there's a lot of problems that with the tools that we have, we're simply unable to help. And I passionately believe that the bulk of what I see, the bulk of what afflicts us as a society, is driven by our modern lifestyles. And that's not me putting blame on anyone, saying we're doing it to ourselves. I'm simply saying that the way modern society is set up collectively, the way that we're living, for many of us is having a negative impact on the way that we feel. And it ain't that hard to change it. And that's what I've tried to do. So I'm going to talk you through some of my thoughts on health. 
my book, which is really my philosophy on health, which is pretty much what I did with every single patient, for those of you who have seen Doctor in the House, whether I was helping a lady reverse her type 2 diabetes in 30 days, a reversal that has proved sustainable for over two years now without any input from me or any other doctor, get rid of a 30-year history of chronic back pain and an addiction to painkillers and sleeping pills, or helping a menopausal lady get rid of most of her menopausal symptoms in four weeks without the use of any hormones, or on the, on the latest series, severe headaches that have been under five different neurologists, the pills weren't working, yet we almost got rid of them. I almost helped the lady get rid of them in six weeks. Getting more energy, chronic insomnia, the bulk of what I did with every single one of those patients no matter what their condition was, is laid out here. Because the bulk of what afflicts us is the way that we're living our lifestyle. So I split up health into four areas. Relaxation, food, movement, and sleep. And I think that is deceptively simple. Because if you get this right, it transforms the way that you feel. Now, I think this is simple and it is achievable for every single one of us. This is not in any way about perfection. It's not about having the perfect diet or the perfect workout regime or even perfect sleep. It's about doing a little bit in each area. And I think that takes the pressure off. And I think that's why this message is resonating with people. You don't need to be perfect. I don't want people... So just, just to be clear, there's four areas, there's five chapters in each of these pillars. And in each chapter, there's a suggestion I make, not a prescription. I don't tell anyone, I've never told a patient what to do. There's not a way that you get compliance, there's not a way you encourage someone to make healthy choices. I want to empower people so that they feel, yeah, they're in control, and if they choose to, they can make those changes. But I don't want people to score five, let's say, in food and five in movement with a total score of 10. I'd much rather you score two in each pillar with a total score of eight because it's about balance. We all, and myself included, overly focus on one area. If I was here five years ago, I'd have been giving you the whole lecture on food. I thought that was everything. But it's not. It really isn't. And I'm going to show you why it's not. So I'd say the first pillar is relaxation. And this is the whole stress piece. There's a very good reason why I started the book with this. It's a thing I think we don't think about. Modern life. Who, in fact, who doesn't feel stressed? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just endemic in modern life. We wake up. Many of us are on our phones straight away. Getting nodding heads already. And there's just noise coming in, emails, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to-do lists. And then we've got, we start off without any downtime. We go, depending on our circumstance in life, we go into doing the school run, rushing around, trying to get to work. Whilst we're traveling, we're trying to get all our work stuff done. We finish. It's the same at home. And, you know, in the past, there was a differentiation between work and home life. That's gone. 10, 15 years ago, you know, and maybe I'm looking at the past with rose-tinted glasses, but I imagine you'd come home from work, you'd have your dinner, and then you'd chill out, maybe watch some TV in the evening. You probably didn't have the functionality where you could actually continue working. But who checks work emails here at the weekend? You weren't doing that 15 years ago. And that is noise. And it's affecting us. We talk about action for happiness. Let's talk about happiness. Let's talk about mental health. One in four of us now in this country at some point are going to have a mental health problem. Think about that for a minute. One in four people. That is not because better diagnostics. Right? That's a serious issue. I detail the story in the, in the book I'm going to share with you now. I can remember it really clearly. I was in a busy afternoon clinic. 
had five people waiting outside, and a 16-year-old boy came in. And he was in with his mother, and had a letter from A&E there. So this young boy had tried, well, this teenage lad, had tried to harm himself at the weekend, and he ended up in A&E. Now they risk assessed him, sent him home, thought he was safe to go home, and they told him to come and see me with a letter for me to start antidepressants. So I knew I had patients waiting, but something didn't sit right with me. I thought, I don't know what's going on here. This seems like quite a well-balanced family. I just couldn't figure out why, why, why is it in this seemingly sort of well-balanced and normal family is this lad trying to harm himself. So I spent 20 minutes talking to him, trying to figure it out. I, was, I knew there was more there. So I said, look, I'm really pressed on time today. Can you come in tomorrow after my morning surgery? I can spend a bit more time trying to find out what's going on here. So they agreed, they came in. And I kind of gleaned from him that social media and his use of his smartphone and social media was, was a bit of a problem for him. So I said to him, I said, would you consider reducing your usage? He goes, why do you think it will help? I said, well, I think it might do. So we agreed that for one hour before bed each night, he would go off social media. I said, all right, I'll give you an appointment in one week. Give that a go for seven days. If you know better, I'll write you that prescription. But he comes back seven days later. He's like, hey, you know what, Doc? I'm, I still don't feel great. But I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm sleeping more. I'm not quite as up and down during the day. I said, all right, well, can we, can we sort of run with that a little bit? And so bit by bit over the next four to six weeks, we changed that from being... We went up to two hours in the morning where he didn't go on social media and two hours in the evening where he didn't. Again, bit by bit, he starts to feel better. He starts to sleep better. His mood is better. He's not cured, right? But he's feeling considerably better. So, okay, at that time, I was also reading a lot of research about diet and mental health. And I thought, well, his diet's full of processed junk food, high sugar, muffins, you know, takeaways. And what that will do, and we don't think about this with food. We think about calories and fat and carbs. But food is information for your body. And if you're having high sugar processed food, your blood sugar's going up. Two hours later, it starts to crash. And when it starts to crash, that's an alarm sign for your body. On an evolutionary level, if our blood sugar's crashing, that's a threat to our survival. So what happens when your blood sugar crashes? Your stress response hormones, adrenaline and cortisol go up. So the food that he's eating is changing his mood. So I help him understand how to eat in a way that's going to balance his blood sugar, which is mainly cutting that junk out, and putting in lots of healthy, natural fats like avocados and olives and nuts and seeds. And bit by bit, he started to feel better. His mood was better. Then I stopped seeing him. And six months later, I get a letter from his mother saying, Dr. Chastity, thank you, you've changed his life. He's like a different boy. He's interacting with his friends at school. He's happy. He's interacting with our local community at weekends. Now, that's just one case. But that's a 16-year-old boy who could have been labeled, medicated, and put on a prescription drug and potentially wouldn't have come off it for many years. Just imagine how many people are being put on these antidepressants. I am not saying that drugs don't have a role. They absolutely do. But we're overusing them for a lot of lifestyle-driven complaints. You know, I'm, a, I, I'm a dad. I've got two young kids. I, I, even telling that story starts to worry me about my kids getting older and how they're going to you know, cope in this you know, social media-heavy world that puts a lot of pressure on people. So, we're getting quite dark here. Let me try and lighten the mood. <laughs> that guy's doing very, very well. Right? Really well. And that's just two of the pillars. That's all he did. Right? Changed a bit with the relaxation pillar, and he changed a bit with his food. And that had a significant difference with his mental health. And I'm seeing that over and over again. 
Now, one of the, the strategies I talk about, and I don't want anyone to have palpitations looking at this, but it's the idea of a smartphone Sabbath. The idea that can we build up to one whole day where we don't look at our phones? Now, look, if a day sounds like too much, start with one hour. Start with two hours. Right? Build up slowly. I'm telling you, if you are used to being on your phone every single day, you will feel like you've had a holiday. I am not kidding. Right? I, I went through a phase where I was doing it once a week. Then, you know, like everyone, I sort of slipped off a bit. You know, I'd go, like, on a Sunday, I'd often go to the park with my phone in my pocket. The kids are playing. I'm like, I'm not going to look at it. Before you know it, you're just you know, having a cheeky look and checking things. So what I do, I leave it at home now. And the experience is completely different. You're not being completely bombarded with noise. If someone texts me, fine. Tough. I'm out with my wife and I'm out with my kids. It can wait. We need to start taking ownership of our time. And I think these phones, as great as they are for so many things, they're also overrunning our lives. So I talk about building up, you know, bit by bit. How can you build up to having a screen-free day on whatever day you choose? Often it is a Sunday. So if you've never done it, I would urge you, this Sunday, if that works for you, even for half a day, leave your phone at home and just see how you feel when you come back. Because if you feel better, you're likely to continue to engage, right? You won't do it because I told you to. You'll do it because you're feeling better. Now, this is probably something that's quite au fait with this audience, and it's about deep breathing, when you breathe out for longer than you breathe in, you activate what's called your parasympathetic nervous system, which is basically your relaxation part of your nervous system. Right? And there's many great methods out there. Right? The method I've come up with in my clinic to help my patients do this is the three, four, five breath, where you breathe in for three, you hold for four, and you breathe out for five. And again, I detail plenty of case studies in the book of how this has really transformed the lives of some of my patients. So simple, so easy, but it changes your biology. It changes the chemistry in your body that quickly. It doesn't take more than a couple of minutes to do. So relaxation, I think, is very, very important. And the thing you've got to realize is that our stress response systems were built in a different era. They were built for a different era, right? Our, our, our stress response systems are designed for us to run away from a lion when we're being attacked. You may have heard that from other speakers in here in the past, I imagine. But they're designed to be turned on quickly for maybe 30 minutes, an hour tops, and then they re return back to normal. But now modern life whether it's your commute. We're here in London. I mean, how stressful must the commute be? I don't know. I don't live in London. <laughs> you tell me. But the commute, the emails, the deadlines, the pressure, the busyness everywhere. Right? If you, I can't change that. I can't change your commute. But what I can do is give you actionable strategies that you can put into practice. One of them is called 15 minutes me time. It's the idea where 15 minutes a day you just carve out some time for yourself and you just sit there doing whatever you want without your phone. <laughs> and try it. I got two Instagram comments this morning, right, from people who said that's been life-changing for them. Someone with severe depression has actually commented and said, look, I, all I've done so far is have that me time and I'm already feeling more positive about things. And look, there's been plenty more. It's not about just doing one of these 20, it's about doing small things in each area, but that's just one intervention, and that's, you know, it really can be that powerful. This is not soft medicine. This is the real medicine that we need for what we're seeing today. The bulk of what I'm seeing, <laughs> the, the bulk of what I see honestly responds to the principles in this book. That's what I use day in, day out with every single one of my patients. Because it really is that important. And we've lost touch with how easy it is to be healthy. Right, this time of year, people are thinking about losing weight. Right? 
I won't put anyone on the spot, but I'm sure people in this room, many people must be thinking, as, as many, much of the population are, about losing weight. And everyone thinks it's about food and movement, but it's not. They are important factors, but they're not the only factors. I recently saw a 48-year-old lady. She's trying to lose weight. And her husband was also trying to lose weight. So they changed their diet. It was a really, really good diet, actually. And they were following it. And you know what? He was dropping weight for fun. Now, she loved her husband. But she was getting a little bit frustrated (laughs) that the same diet was really helping him, but not helping her. So we spoke about movement, and she started to, you know, she went to the gym, and we got this thing in her, in her office where she did 10,000 steps a day. Still nothing. No weight loss at all. And she was, I, I could tell, she was, she was always wound up, her mind was always on, she could never switch off. And I thought, I bet she's overly stressed, and that's why she's not getting rid of her weight. Of course, she didn't believe me at first. What a ridiculous comment to make. So I actually did something I don't often do, but I did measure her cortisol levels in her saliva. And cortisol is our body's primary stretch response hormone. And they came back double the upper limit of normal. They were hugely elevated. So Dr. Chatter, you know, I really am stressed, aren't I? I said, yeah, I honestly think you are. And here's the thing that people don't realize. If your body is under stress, chronically, your body feels it's under attack. So it will not let go of weight. It will hold on to weight. So you can diet as much as you want. You can work out at the gym as much as you want, but you ain't going to lose the weight. And I'm seeing that over and over again. What did I do with her? 15 minutes of me time in the evenings as a bit of downtime. Sometimes she'd sit in a bath. Sometimes she'd just listen to music. And five minutes a day of meditation. That is it. One month later, over a stone in weight loss. I see that over and over again because the body is interconnected. We're looking at all these things as separate individual components and they're not. You change one thing, you change everything. And actually, if you take a step back and go, you're on a great diet, you're moving well. You know, if you're an engineer, you go, okay, there must be a different problem here. And there often is. And I think it's these four pillars. I think this is the recipe, this is the blueprint of how we live well in this modern world. And I've not shared all of them with you yet, so I probably won't get time to go through them all today. But the plan works for everybody. If you are already ill and have a health complaint or a label of a disease, the tools in this book will help you feel better. If you want to prevent getting sick in the future, many people are worried about Alzheimer's these days. We know that you can many things you can do now that will reduce the likelihood of getting Alzheimer's in the future. It's all in here. And if you just want more out of your everyday life, if you want more energy, more vitality, less brain fog, tired of needing coffee to get you through every single day, these are the same principles that are going to help you. If you're vegan, this book applies to you. If you choose to eat meat, this book applies to you. And I've written the book very carefully for that reason, so it applies to every single person in here, around the country, and every single person who walks into my practice. Because health has become too complicated. And when people on social media are fighting about fat v. carbs, all you do is alienate people. And then people switch off and say, oh, the experts don't know, I'm not going to do anything. And we don't create a healthier and a happier society by doing that. When it comes to food, and let's go into food, food is more than fat versus carbs. But good health is more than just food. It's one component, an important component, but one component nonetheless. My first suggestion in the food pillar, is denormalize sugar. And I recognize that we're hardwired to crave sugar. 
So it's not about going on a crazy sugar detox if you don't want to. But it's about denormalizing it. It's about not having it morning at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you're having breakfast cereal in the morning, a sandwich for lunch, and pasta for dinner, there is a high chance you're having sugar three times a day. That's the problem. Having the occasional sugary treat now and again, that ain't the problem. It's the fact that we're having it every day. I talk about my take on five a day. And I think we should be looking about five different vegetables, ideally of different colors every day. And that's why I've got this rainbow chart in the book to help people make those choices. You, it's not that I'm anti-fruit at all. And I, I mentioned this in the book. But my experience is that when you talk to patients about their five a day, everyone's just having super sweet fruit. <laughs> So I would much rather prefer vegetables. And we know that the different colors have an impact on our, the health of our gut. Have you heard of good bugs and bad bugs? Yeah, that's overly simplistic. But the reality is the health of our gut and these trillions of bacteria that live inside us is critical for not only the way our tummy and our gut feels, but our mood, our skin, whether we've got joint pain or not. We're now recognizing how powerful having a healthy gut is. One of the simplest things you can do is have five different colors every single day. But what do I do? How do I incorporate this into my everyday life? Well, I've got a chart sitting on my fridge. And when I'm at home, which I'm clearly not tonight, <laughs> but we sit around and we will literally go around the table, myself, my wife, and my two kids, and see how many colors have we hit off. And it was just a few nights ago, my son so, oh, Daddy, I've not had red today. So he went to the fridge, gets out a red pepper, cuts it, and eats it. But we made it into a game. Right? It's not about, oh, you've got to eat your veg. It's, hey, who's got the most colors? Right? Who's got kids in here? Try it. It works, I promise you. you know? The other suggestion I, I make in the, the food pillar is not changing what you eat. It's changing when you eat. So there's some absolutely fantastic research coming out of California. Now, most of this has, uh, has been done on animal studies, which is where they're doing the research on it. Okay? But it's shown that if you compress your eating into a 12-hour eating window, it can have benefits on weight loss, blood sugar balance, immune system function, liver function, and much more. Now, a 12-hour eating window, that's pretty achievable. That's like having your breakfast at 8 in the morning and finishing your dinner by 8 p.m. Or 7 till 7, or 9 till 9. Actually, it doesn't matter. Whatever works for your, excuse me, whatever works for your life. Now, human studies with this are underway. And I emailed the guy behind all this research, Dr. Sachinanda Panda, a couple of nights ago to find out where they're up to. Because it's looking very, very promising, but we won't have any results to properly publish for 2019. But that's such a simple strategy. If you don't want to change your diet, if you're sick of hearing all the different diets, think about just eating all your food within a 12-hour window. Does that sound palatable? Yeah. yeah. It does work. And there's powerful science behind it. When you've not eaten for about 12 hours, your gut gets a break. A process called autophagy has kicked in. But autophagy is what the Nobel Prize winner for medicine, he's the guy who discovered it, that's, what, that's who it was awarded to last year. But autophagy is basically housekeeping for your body. So if you're in your kitchen and you don't wash up every day, and I'm sure all of you do wash up all your dishes, but what happens? Mess accumulates, it builds up. That's what happens in your body when you're constantly eating and not giving your body a break. Right? But how many of us override that now? It's dark, it's January. Often in the evening, we're sitting in front of the television. You know, open the cupboard, see what's in it, just munch away. And I call this, actually, an itchy mouth. <laughs> we're not hungry. We're really not hungry. It's just, you know, we fancy something in there because it's there. And that's actually another theme throughout this whole book is control the environment that you can control. 
So as soon as you walk out those front doors, it is so hard to make healthy choices, right? I said, don't use up your willpower in your house because you've got no chance. Really, you know, you try and buy a coffee these days. Well, what happens? You've got to run the gauntlet. You've got to look at muffins, pastries, croissants. And then if you have used your willpower and you've got to the till, what does the barista ask you? Would you like a pan of chocolate with that, sir? Right? You're being tested constantly. That ain't going to change. You cannot control what goes on out there, but you can control what goes on inside your house. So if you are trying to cut down on sugar this month, get it out of your house. Because if it's there, you, will, you can white knuckle it for a week. You will crack. You know, that went to me in December. You know, it was dark. I was feeling overworked. I was watching something on telly. I thought, God, really fancy a sweet treat. But you know what? We don't keep them in the house. I was literally looking in the cupboards. I just thought, I don't, you know what? After 10 minutes, that goes. It really does. I don't keep it there. Movement. We know that's a critical component of health, right? We should move more. So why aren't we? Why are so many of us struggling to get what 30, 40 years ago were basic levels of movement? Well, clearly our lifestyles, our computers, our phones, the sedentary nature of what we do now, that has an impact. But what are we going to do about it? Well, what I do about it is make it easy for people to work out. So strength training is very much undervalued across our whole society. You know, we associate it with people in their 20s and 30s trying to look buff, trying to look good. But you know, your lean muscle mass is one of the strongest predictors of how well you are going to be when you're older. It's the number one predictor. And above the age of 30, we can lose up to 5% of our lean muscle mass every 10 years. I'm looking out there, a lot of us are over the age of 30 in here. <laughs> Just. <laughs> so strength training is critically important. But if I said to you, guys, the only way to reverse this is to go to a gym, right, one hour, three times a week, how many of you are really going to be doing that in four weeks' time? Some of you might be. So I came up with something called the five-minute kitchen workout. <laughs> now, everything I come up with, I'm not claiming to be the first person, right? But I became a doctor to help people. So if I'm in my practice and I'm hearing from them that actually they don't have time to exercise, they don't like going to a gym, it's too far for them, right? I've got to come up with a different strategy. Or I can just say, oh, patients don't do what I tell them to do. I just don't buy that. If you communicate in the right way with patients, they do want to do what you ask them to do. But our, our job is to communicate effectively with them so that they buy into why we're asking them to make those changes. So this workout, anyone in here can do it. Because you can modify it for all strength and all ability levels. I've got 20-year-old patients doing it. I've got 80-year-old patients doing it. But I had a couple recently in their early 60s who I recommended that they do more strength training. They really were losing their lean muscle mass and it was affecting their energy, their sleep. It was affecting all kinds of things. I said, are you sure, doc? I said, yeah. So I, you know, I do what I do in my practice. I got my jacket off. I was on the floor and I was actually showing them how to do it and talking them through it. So they were a bit nervous. So I said, you know, there's a press-up. Right? And I said, well, and they said, well, I'm not sure about press-up. So can you do a press-up against the wall? So they literally get against the wall and get them to do a press-up. And they go, yeah, okay, I can do that. Can you do five to ten of those? So yeah, I think so. And I talked them through how with her kitchen cooker she could do calf raises. And how she could do tricep dips on her kitchen chair. And how she could do lunges with a bottle of olive oil. Right? Yeah, they were skeptical. <laughs> But you know what? I said to them, can you give me five minutes twice a week? Ten minutes, that's all I'm asking. I said, yeah, sure. They came up four weeks later, and they were doing it six times a week on their landing while their evening bath was running. You know, just totally incredible. 
because they feel good. But if I give them an hour three times a week to a gym that costs 40 quid a month and you know, they've got to get changed and get to, there are all these obstacles there. And that's why we're not moving, because we, we've outsourced our idea of movement to a gym. And if we do get to the gym, we think we're done. Oh, yeah, I've done my workouts. It's a think about it. So next time, that ain't working, and it will never work. We've got to build movement into our everyday life. That is just one strategy I use. I've got something called an office workout, right? Two minutes. You don't need to get changed. My dream is to have every office in this country before they go for lunch. They do together this little office workout. And actually, I was, I, was, I, was, I did a live interview today on BBC Radio. And actually, I challenged the presenter on air. And actually, literally afterwards, and they filmed it. I think they're going to put it out at some point. But I literally taught her how to do the office workout in her little DJ booth. Because actually, it's not that hard, and I feel really good. It is easy. Good health is meant to be easy, right? We have overcomplicated it. How many people have got five minutes twice a week to do a strength workout? <laughs> yeah, I honestly, you know, I, don't, I never want to tell anyone what to do, but, you know, I'd love it. If you guys consider this when you get home, and, you know, I will probably want to get to my hotel room tonight. I'll probably do five minutes in my hotel room. Because that's how I look at health. It's about these little things that you do day in, day out. And if that's all you do with your movement, you will literally be making a massive change in your health. Actually, one thing you may not know about, and it's something that might be relevant at this time of year, and that's over-exercise. You know, it, it is quite a big problem. Um, a recent patient of mine was a 42-year-old single mum. And she was working two jobs. And she was really unhappy with her energy levels and her weight. So she did what most people do. She changed her diet. Her diet was pretty good, actually. But she still wasn't losing much weight. And although she didn't have much money, she really took health seriously. So she hired a personal trainer three times a week for one-hour sessions. And she was doing this. She was hammering it. Wait, was it coming off? Her PT was pushing it even harder. And the classes were things like, you know, ab attack and thigh burn. And, you know, but, but the reality was these workouts were attacking her. Right? She still wasn't losing weight. She was doing what everyone and all the magazines are telling her to do. What does that do to someone? They're trying hard to lose weight, and they're doing all these things, yet it ain't happening. And I said to her, I said, you know what? I think that's the wrong kind of exercise for you. You are knackered. You are deplete. You're working two jobs. You've got no energy left. And that exercise that you're doing with your PT, you've got to stop it, because that's depleting you even more. So that is a stress on your body. I said to her, I think you should cut those out and do two one-hour yoga sessions a week. Again, complete skepticism. She wouldn't do it. She goes, no, 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 I'm just going to work harder. Because everything that she's been told and it's been ingrained in her head, it's been, that's the way to lose weight. Four weeks goes, fine, she goes, all right, doc, I'm going to try it. Again, within six weeks, she loses a stone. And she cuts out all those punishing workouts and does something that actually restores and rejuvenates her. That's the missing piece in how these things are all connected. And what I love about this four-pillar framework is that each and every single one of us can apply it in our own lives to assess our own health. And if you don't know where to start with your health, I say, have a think about which of those pillars do you need the most work in. We all intuitively know. So for me at the moment, it's the relaxation pillar. I am really struggling at the moment with that. Generally, I have dialed in food and movement into my life over five or six years. Right? But I'm struggling to switch off at the moment. I'm traveling a lot. I'm speaking a lot. I'm out promoting this book that I really believe can transform the health of thousands of people across this country. So I'm passionate to get out there and spread the message because I think it's important. But is it taking its toll? Yeah. So I know I need to prioritize that. And I'd ask you guys to have a little think. In fact, maybe adopt one of Mark's strategies and 
you know, maybe we should just take one minute out and have a think about which of those pillars do you think you need the most work in? You know, it's not normally what I do, but I'm going to try Mark's thing and maybe tell a colleague. You know, maybe tell the person next to you, which of the one do you think you need the, the most work in? Do you want to give it a go? All right, guys, have you all managed to have a chat about it? Yeah? Do you, do you think most of you know which pillar you need the most work in? Is it quite obvious to most of you which the missing piece is? Yeah? Because I'm telling you, and I see it over and over again, if your diet is good enough, you know what? Trying to get another 5%, 10% improvement will not give you a 5%, 10% improvement in your, in your health. But maybe going to bed an hour earlier at night for the next week will do. You'll get much more gain and much quicker gains doing this. Sleep. This is the last pillar I'm going to talk about. It's the fourth pillar that I talk about in the book. Now, make no mistake about this. We are in the middle of a sleep deprivation epidemic. And that sounds quite alarming, but it really is. Scientists from Oxford University are telling us now that we're sleeping about one to two hours less than we were 40 years ago. In the context of an eight-hour sleep cycle, we may have lost up to 25% of our sleep. I find that incredible. And how many of us prioritize sleep? Because... In 2018, I bet you, if you are not actively prioritizing sleep, you're probably not getting enough. We've got too many distractions now. There are so many things competing for our attention that will keep us awake. Netflix is a prime one of them. <laughs> and I'm just as guilty as anyone else. So you've got to actively prioritize sleep. And sleep has got short-term effects, Right? If you're trying to make healthy behavior choices, you're trying to change your diet in January. Well, if you've not slept well, what do you crave the next morning? Do you feel like getting to the gym? Or do you feel like doing a five-minute kitchen workout? No. Your mood goes. You're more reactive with your work colleagues, with your partner. All because you haven't slept the night before. All because you didn't wind down before bed. You didn't sleep, and then you make a whole load of bad choices the next day. But long term, this is very serious, because sleep deprivation increases your likelihood of all kinds of things, obesity, type 2 diabetes, dementia. Hey, dementia is something everyone's scared of these days, right? In Alzheimer's, you get a protein called beta amyloid accumulating in your brain. Modern science is now telling us when we sleep deeply, we clear out these amyloid in our brain. You've got to realize that Alzheimer's starts 30 years before you get it. You don't just wake up one day with it. It has been building up in your body for years until you finally cross that threshold where you get a diagnosis. I don't say this to scare you. I say this to empower you to go, well, there's plenty you can do. Because in 16 and a half years of seeing patients, the vast majority of people who are struggling with their sleep are doing something in their everyday lifestyle that they don't realize is negatively impacting their ability to sleep. Yes, there are primary sleep disorders, no question. But in my experience, the bulk of it is lifestyle related because our default position is to be able to sleep. One of the big problems now is there's no switch off in the evening. We don't have a bedtime routine. Many of you put your hands up that you've got kids. Well, do you wind up your kids before they go to bed? 
Do you watch a really engrossing drama which has got them thinking before they go to bed? Or do you know you've got to dim the lights, got to quieten the mood? Why do we as adults think we are any different? We are not. Even that simple tip alone, having a relaxing bedtime routine, can be transformative. So how many hours should we sleep for? I don't know. And I see all the research and I find it confusing. So what do I ask in my clinic to find out whether a patient's sleep health is in good shape or not? I've come up with this weight questionnaire to assess my patient's sleep health. It's dead easy. Do you wake up feeling refreshed? Because that's what sleep should do, right? And if you can wake up feeling refreshed after five hours sleep, I would argue potentially that's okay for you at where you are right now in the context of your life. And that's a problem with these big global statements. Everyone needs eight hours sleep. So what happens if you're someone who sleeps seven hours and you feel great on that? You start to stress out, God, I'm not hitting eight hours and I'm meant to hit eight hours. And then you don't sleep because you're stressed out about it. <laughs> a lot of people are nodding their heads there, so I'm, I think this is resonating. Do you wake up at the same time within 30 minutes every day without an alarm? That tells me, is your body's natural circadian rhythm in good shape? Because we should be. And do you fall asleep within 30 minutes of trying to go to sleep? These are just really simple questions. There's a question there, zero, one, and two. So the maximum score you can do is six. And I argue, if you are anything but a six, the tools in this book will help you get there. I'm not a six at the moment. I have been a six, but I also know how to get back on track to get to six. And that's the point of this book, right? The point of this book is yes, to give you a plan to help improve the way that you feel right now here in January. But when life throws you its curveballs, as it will, work stress, a family member not being well, deadlines to meet, Right? This is a blueprint to help you get back on track. You're not going to hit perfection and then stay there forever. Right? Things are going to change. And my, my hope with this book is that it becomes a blueprint for people that they can pull off their shelves. Like later in the year, their sleep goes off track. Gosh, you know what? I'm just going to go straight to that sleep pillar. Oh, yeah, I'm going to try this, this, and this and get their sleep back on track. Or when they find they're being very sedentary and they're not moving. Actually, do you know what? I'm just going to go to that move pillar. And none of these suggestions cost any money at all. Every suggestion in relaxation, every suggestion in move, every suggestion in sleep doesn't cost a penny. It is accessible for every single person. And that was my goal with this book, for it to be relevant for everyone. Now, food... There is an argument about whether one can eat well at a decent price in the modern world. That's a separate argument. But even the food suggestions, like denormalize sugar, drink more water, and explain why, I recommend that. Eat all your food within a 12-hour eating window. They're all free. They don't cost anyone anything more but a bit of application into what they're doing. Right? So that's at least 18 out of the 20 ones that I can guarantee you cost nothing. But they'll have a profound impact on the way that you feel. What is my best tip for sleep? Probably a no-tech 90. This idea that for 90 minutes before bed, you switch off all technology. If you've never tried it, it really can be transformative. And it, and it does that for two reasons. Number one, you reduce all the emotional noise coming into your head. Emails, Facebook, whatever it is, news updates and what's happened somewhere else in the world to wind you up before you go to bed. I took the news app off my phone about 18 months ago. I'm not even tempted to put it back. Right? I will look at it when I choose to access news, but not when the notification pushes it my way. But so the first thing is you reduce emotional noise. The other thing is, I know many of you will have heard of blue light. 
A blue light is a wavelength of light. In nature, you only get blue light in the morning, maybe the early afternoon. You do not get it in the evening. So when you're looking at your phones this far away from your face in the evening, right, there's blue lights coming out, and that reduces levels of a hormone called melatonin. And melatonin is a sleep hormone. We need melatonin to help us fall asleep, right? If there was a drug out there that was changing levels of melatonin in your body, there'd be a warning with it saying, this changes your hormone levels this will negatively impact your sleep. Yet that's what we're all doing every single evening when we look at these things. So I'm saying, why not have a trial for a few days without and see how you feel? Right? And my tip for doing it is the one that I do, so I leave it downstairs. If I take it upstairs, I cannot resist looking at the damn thing. Right? I charge my phone downstairs, so when I go up at bedtime, my phone's not there most of the time, but hey, sometimes I do, and then I don't sleep so well. Then I get a second wind, and I'm still looking at stuff till late, right? So I get it, but I know how to get back on track. So that's something that I think really changes people's health. The other one you may not have thought about, and it's the first suggestion I make in the sleep pillar, it's called embrace morning light. It's this idea that you can go out for, and expose yourself to natural light in the morning that's going to help you sleep in the evening. And we know why that is. Right? The differential between your maximum light exposure and your minimum one also helps set your body's circadian rhythm, which is what gets you to sleep in the evening. So at this time of year, you wake up in the dark. Let's say you're in transport or you're in the tube, and then you're stuck in an office all day. Right? A brightly lit office, there's a, there's a unit of light called Lux, right? On a sunny day, you go outside for about 10, 15 minutes, you get exposed to 30,000 Lux. In a brightly lit office, you're probably getting 500 to 1,000 Lux maximum. You go out on a cloudy day, you're still hitting 15 to 20,000 Lux, right? So getting outside in the morning helps you set your body's circadian rhythm. And again, yesterday I got two tweets from people saying the only thing that they've changed is they've, they've started to embrace morning light. They've gone out for a 15-minute walk in the morning. That's helping them sleep in the evening. It's a simple tip, but it can be transformative. So look, guys, I'm, I, I've, I've, you know, I do believe in the power of this book to change lives, to change families. These changes that I recommend, these are changes I live by. These are things that I do with my kids. The five-minute kitchen worker, I'm doing that with my kids three, four times a week. Yeah, drives my wife up the wall sometimes, but we do it. <laughs> and it's fun because I try and model the behavior that I want my kids to have. I try and model it. I'm not perfect. I think instead of me telling them what I think they should be doing, I try and do it so they observe it. They, they get included in this. And we were talking before about how you create change in the wider population. You know, one thing that worries me, having a son at seven years old and a daughter at five, is what I see being served at schools. It drives me up the wall. But I know going in and talking and lecturing doesn't do anything. So I've tried all that. So last year, actually, and my son's, there was a day out... And my wife made for him uh, snack, you know, all taking like snacks and treats, and she made this little fruit kebab for him. It took about two minutes to make, right? And he goes, and when everyone's having the sugary stuff, well, he had these fruit kebabs. And then at the end of the day, the teacher said to my wife and myself, said, "Look, we didn't think about it. What a great idea! We're going to start doing that on all the school trips now." I wasn't preaching to them. That was just doing what we want to do for our kids. And I'm not saying that's the right thing, right? I struggle as much as any other parent. I'm trying to make the best choices for my kids where I can. But it was really a lesson for me that actually, just by seeing that, they thought, well, we could do that. We could expand it out. So I know that was an issue, Mark, you were talking about before, is how do we create change in a, in a wider society? And, you know, one of the most inspiring things for me, feedback since this has been out there, has been so many people are, are coming back to me 
I'm saying, look, I love it. I can't put the book down. I think it's an enjoyable read as well as a useful one. And I'm going to go and buy my mum a copy now. I'm going to go and buy my sister a copy. I bought my GP a copy. <laughs> I've had over 100, 100 communications from doctors. Some of them, have, they put reviews on Amazon. Some of them have emailed me directly saying, we're going to get this book and put it in our practices. We're going to start signposting our patients to this book. Right? That makes me happy because that's what I did it for. This is about giving this information out there, then people can personalize it for their life, because I don't know what goes on in your life. I don't know how busy you are, how stressed you are. I don't know what your expectation is around health, but I do know the universal health principles that will help every single one of us, and that is what's in this. What I'm hoping to launch in the next few days, seeing how well the book's doing, seeing all the feedback that I'm getting, I want to launch something called My Four Pillars, because I want this book and these ideas to transform the health of as many people as possible, but that happens when people spread the message, not when I go around spreading it. That happens when people tell their stories. I said, with the hashtag My Four Pillars, I want people to record a video into their phone and get it on social media to their networks to spread, what did you do? What pillar... You know, what change did you make? How is it making you feel? How has it made you think about something different? What commitment are you going to make to your network? That's a great way of being accountable. You want to make some changes? Record a video. Put it out on social media. Now, look, I'm going to probably be launching it shortly, but if you guys want to get involved, I highly encourage you to do so. Because by doing that, you'll not only help yourself, You will inspire other people who go, you know what, I might try that. I want this to try and create a movement where we create a healthier and happier society. I think we can do that. I was told to wrap up at 7.50, 7.56, so not too bad. (laughs) Guys, I think I'm going to sort of wrap it up there, um, and Mark's going to come and do some Q&A. But yeah, look, I hope... I hope you got a little bit out of that. I hope you learned a few things. And just think about one thing that you've heard tonight that you might want to implement. And maybe tell someone at the end so you actually have that little bit of accountability. And uh, whatever you do choose to do, I wish you all the best with your health. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, so we've got, we've got plenty of time left, everyone, and, and what we find works really well in these events is a, is, a, is a chance to hear from you and ask questions to Rangan, but I wanted to slightly abuse my position of wearing a microphone of asking a couple of things I've always wanted to ask you, Rangan, as you're a real hero of mine, and I think what you've shown again this evening is, is so relevant for all of us, especially at this time of year. But before we go back into the personal stuff around you know, our own health as individuals, you, you hinted at something with your, what raised a laugh with everyone about giving the book to your GP. And it, what, what, thinking about this um, question that for the society as a whole, I can't help but thinking that what we all need collectively is to have you as our GP. Um, <laughs> and of course, that, that's not great for your well-being to do that many people. But um, well, how do we change the system of ha- national health provision around this kind of lifestyle advice to individuals, because we go in and we get prescriptions and we get sort of listened to, and for very understandable reasons, GP have loads of time pressure on them, but why are we not hearing this kind of lifestyle advice, and how can you change that? Hey, look, I think it's a great question, and one that comes up a lot. Um, I think we're really going to create change in society. It's not going to come from one profession or one area. I think it's a multi-pronged approach. You need individuals on board, you need doctors on board, you need schools, hospitals, Government, it's a much wider, I think, uh, you know, it, it's much wider in terms of how you really create that societal change. As a doctor, I think we, I think the system that we practice in doesn't lend itself very well to this kind of advice. We've got very short, compressed time frames in which to see patients, which I don't think helps. And you know, you've got to understand that the NHS, the way it's currently set up, it works in a different era. Right? It works in an era that maybe 30, 40 years ago where we're seeing acute problems, problems that respond very well to that quick fix. You know, you've got a chest infection, you see a doctor, right? it gives you a pill to get rid of the bug that's causing it, and you know, your, your chest infection goes away. Done. 
right, move on to the next patient. But the problem now is that what we're seeing, the bulk of what we're seeing, are chronic problems that build up over time and they don't respond well to these magic bullet interventions that we've been accustomed to. Yet the whole model is still based around that. So I think that's one problem. The second problem, I think, and it's equally as important, is that as doctors, you know, the stuff that I put in this book is stuff that I have learned off my own back over the last five or six years of traveling around the world to talk to the leading experts around the world at my own expense because I, I was driven to find out more. And, you know, I had personal reasons for doing that. And actually, you find most doctors who've gone down this route have actually got a personal reason, either their own health, where they weren't satisfied to be put on medication and stay on it for the rest of their life, or a family member or somebody close to them. And that has led them to, to confront what's so great about our medical training, but where the holes are. And I think of it as this, that we're still applying 20th century thinking to a lot of 21st century problems. I call this progressive medicine, and the reason I do is because I'm very proud of my medical training. I think it was brilliant, but I realize it's good at certain problems. If I've got a pneumonia, yes, I want the best thing that modern medicine has got. If I get knocked down in a road out there, and I want to be ambulance for the best A&E and have the best treatments, right? no question. But we apply those same principles to chronic disease, and it doesn't work, right? Because most chronic illness... You've got to think about it, and I detail this. This is, this, is, this is, after 16 and a half years, this is how I see it. We've all got a personal threshold, right? So let's say that you were born in optimal health, right? You can deal with multiple insults, right? A poor diet, loads of antibiotics, right? Poor sleep, a relationship breakup, right? Losing your job. Bit by bit, they all mount up. But something will tip you over that threshold, and that's when you get sick. At that point, it's no good looking at the last thing that set you off. The whole thing needs rebuilding from scratch, right? How many of you recognize that in your own life? You know, you can juggle one ball, two ball, three balls, four balls. The fifth ball comes in. What happens? Everything, just, you just can't cope with anything. With a lot of my patients who've got autoimmune problems, I plot out a timeline from from when they were young to where they are now. And I put in major life events, and almost always now I'm seeing a big period of stress precedes the diagnosis. That's not me saying stress has caused it. But maybe people were building up, and they were building up, and they were building up, and maybe the last stressor is the thing that took them over. And I go through the science on stress and how that impacts our gut and how it impacts every system in our body. So, but we're not trained to think like that, right? And how am I trying to, you know, I'm trying to make a change instead of not just doing something on TV. Right? I've worked really hard with some colleagues to create the very first prescribing lifestyle medicine course that has been accredited by our Royal College. So the Royal College of GPs have accredited two months ago this new course. It actually runs a week on Saturday in London for the first time. We've got a ton of doctors coming. And I want to run that several times next year. My goal next year is to train a thousand doctors, if possible, how you start doing this. And there is a thirst for it, right? Doctors are now hearing stories. A lot of them have contacted me after watching Doctor and now say, look, we want to learn how you do that. Because we weren't taught how to do Without that. Without having to stay overnight to do with houses for yeah, <laughs> two weeks. But you can't do it, right? Yeah. 10 minutes is not ideal, but you can do a lot in 10 minutes, right? If, if you come in, right? I'll give you this example. What we can do better is prioritize lifestyle, right? We don't do that. Most of us don't do that. So the classic case, right, is let's say Fred's coming in and you know, he's waiting outside and I go through his blood results and I say, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's got um, type 2 diabetes now. So Fred walks in the door and these are two extremes, but one option could be Hi, Fred. Um, look, I've got some bad news. Uh, your last blood test is in the range for type 2 diabetes. Now, it's pretty worrying that. It can cause early death. Um, it can increase your risk of heart attacks. Um, now, we've got some great drugs. We'll start you off on one of them today. Now, normally, after a year, we need to put you on a second drug. You may need to be on insulin at some point in the future. But, you know, we'll, we'll definitely help you do that. We'll help sort that out for you. Don't worry. And as they're walking out, 
Yeah, and if you can actually just get to the gym and lose a bit of weight, that's going to help you as well. Right? That is not uncommon. Right? And I'm not criticizing people who do that. I understand the pressures of what it's like. But in those same 10 minutes, you could be, oh, hi, Fred. Okay, well, look, we've got some information in your blood. Um, now, you're actually, you've got a condition called type 2 diabetes. Now, let me explain to you what that is. It means your blood sugar's gone very high, but there's so much we can do about this. This is a condition that's actually driven by your lifestyle choices. You may not have realized it, but there's plenty we can do now to help you get on top of that. And if we're lucky, we might be able to reverse it. Would you like me to help you understand how we can find some of these lifestyle tweaks that you can put into your life? Right? It doesn't take long. But a totally different outcome with a patient because the way we prioritize it you know, will impact. If, we do, if it's a throwaway comment at the end of the consultation, right? that's how it's deemed by the patient. Oh, yeah, you know, I need the drugs. Oh, a bit of lifestyle. But hey, hey, I just take the drugs. Right? But I tell you, when you have that conversation with people, people want to make change. They may find it hard. Right? In 2015, so that's th- what, three years ago now, one of the world's top medical journals, The Lancet, published an editorial where it said clearly... For mental health problems, nutrition should be a first-line intervention in the same way that it is with something like a cardiology problem or something like type 2 diabetes. How many times are people going and see their doctor? Who, who, how many times has nutrition been discussed when someone goes in with a mental health problem? Pardon? Most of the doctors are not aware of it. They're not aware. Because we've been trained to think of diagnosis and treatment with drugs. Now, I'm not, again, I'm very keen to add, I'm not saying that doesn't have its place, right? But like that story I shared right at the start, about that 16-year-old boy, right? There are cases like that all over the country. They're being put on pills, and they're staying on those pills. And, you know, look at it another way. Every one of those pills, right, even if they're needed, a documented side effect of an antidepressant is an increased risk of suicide. That's a documented side effect, Right? I'm not saying they're never warranted, but what I am saying is, before we give something that has the potential risk to increase someone already with a low mood of increasing their risk of suicide, should we not try safer interventions first? Worst case scenario, you change your diet for four weeks, right? Worst case scenario is you'll know better, right? That's the downside. And actually, 11 months ago, the very first randomized controlled trial was published showing that for severe depression, a modified Mediterranean diet showed a statistically significant difference in reduction in depressive symptoms. Right? It was a small trial. It's only 72 people. Right? But like, we've got this information now. Let's start using it. So I'm excited. I think progress is being made because in 2018, to have a course on how you prescribe this, mm. the science behind it, being accredited by the Royal College of GPs, I think that's progress. That's fantastic. Um, so, yeah. So, so from, the, from the really big picture of societal challenge, I'd like to turn to, before I open up to everyone else, ask you a, a more personal question. So when I have interacted with you in the run-up to this event and this evening, it's obvious you're in a whirlwind around this particular amazing book you've produced and all the attention it's generating and you want to really maximise it, but... I can imagine that it puts you under massive pressure right now. And as you say, we have these stresses that build up in our lives, and sometimes you can't get away from the fact that there's a particularly busy time at work or a major source of commitments. But, you know, it sounds like you already put your own pillars into practice. But when you're in that really intense situation of, you know, event night after night in hotels, how, how do you cope with that kind of maybe almost one-off level of major stress? Yeah, it's... <laughs> You know, it can be challenging. It's, it's literally the same thing. It's, 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 it's what of these principles can I apply? You know, I have to accept that I'm going to be busy. I'm going to be doing lots of things. I'm not going to have my regular routine. But I accept that. So things I'm trying to do at the moment, and I have done it for the last few mornings, which has been very helpful, is I've made a commitment to doing 10 minutes of meditation every morning. Uh, and I'm currently using the Calm app, which I really like. And... You know, it's incredible, you know, I've, I talk about meditation a lot in the book, and, and meditation can be quite a scary term for so many people. But, you know, it depends how you perceive meditation. What, what, what is it? I've yet to find a form of meditation that doesn't work for a patient if I can find the right one for them, right? So, listening to music, 
right? Listen to your favorite piece of music for 10 minutes with your headphones on, with your eyes closed. That can be a meditation. But not if you're also scrolling <laughs> at the same time. That ain't meditation, right? But I find that when I get in a regular pattern of meditating, even for five minutes a day, right, I get more energy. I sleep better in the evening. I can deal. I'm not as reactive when stress has come up during the day. And a, a really interesting point is, if you make a habit of doing it at the same time every day, some days, you know what? You'll feel like you're going through your to-do list and you're not really hitting the zone. But that's okay. It's not about perfectly managing to switch your mind off every single day. That's, you know, it's impractical for many of us, but that daily practice does make a difference. It really does. And you know, I, I make deals with my patients all the time. I say, well, look, you can, you, know, you brush your teeth for what, four minutes a day? So right, why'd you do that? It's because, because it's been prioritized since you were a kid. It's become a habit. I said, can you give me two minutes of meditation a day? And two minutes then becomes five minutes, and five minutes becomes 10 minutes. But if you say do 20 minutes a day, it never happens, right? I love that analogy. A friend, friend of mine, says, uh, Andy Gibson from MindApple, says, why don't we give our mental health the same priority we give our dental health? Yes. Yeah, so it's quite it's interesting, isn't it? it yeah, and the other thing with it is sometimes, and I've learned from my mistakes, I used to say to patients, yeah, go and do this meditation. They'd come back and say, hey, Doc, I tried it once or twice. It's not for me, meditation. I said, well, if I actually run the London Marathon, would you go around the block once and then come back and say, no, it's not for me? Or would you recognize that you have to train your body to be able to do it? If we've had a monkey mind our entire lives and we can't switch off, we're not going to suddenly be able to plug into an app no matter how good and just you know, be totally zen. It's just not going to happen. It's a practice. But that's the one practice that I know helps me. But when I'm busy, it's the one that goes as well really quickly, which is... To, 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 sat, you know, to stand here in front of so many of you and to say that I don't have five minutes a day to meditate is frankly ridiculous. But often I convince myself, I don't have five minutes. I've got to answer that email. Um, and, and, and ironically, you do this five minutes and you're so much more productive afterwards, aren't you? They say you should meditate for, let's say, five minutes normally every day, except on, bu on busy days when you should do it ten minutes. You know? <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. So um, let's open up to questions from all of you. There's some microphones in the audience, so please do put your hands up if you'd like to ask Ryan a question, um, and uh, if you can wait for the microphone. So can I see a show of hands? Where are we, we looking at? So there's a gentleman down here, and then we'll go to a lady over there. Thanks, Adam. First of all, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, and more important, more, more more wonderful work that you're doing for all these years. Thank you. And I just want to ask a question also and connect to what you're saying. I believe that if you want to change it on a big scale, we have to do the evident base, which you have got it, but for, to convince the National Health Service, we can do on the large trials to do evident base, which what the National Health Service want to see, of your method. I'm happy to help you to duplicate you many times by computerize it, that both doctors and patients can do it, and then we can show in clinical, in clinical way that it's more effective than many medications and other methods, and more cost-effective, and then the National Health Service start to implement it. Mm -hmm. If you're happy, I'm very happy to work with well, you. Well, I'd definitely love to chat. I mean, I think the wider point is that, you know, how are we going to get this sort of change widespread? And I think you're right. We are looking for more powerful evidence. And, the problem is that the way that we have been accustomed to looking at evidence has been the sorts of trials that work very well for drugs, right? So you take 100 people, 50 people get the drug, 50 people don't. Who gets better? Sure, but, right, here's, here's the problem. Some of these are multi-pronged interventions, right? And, and actually, I'll tell you, there's an interesting story on that, okay? Professor Bredesen, who is one of the top neurologists, I think, in terms of the research he's doing, has actually reversed mild to moderate cognitive decline in Alzheimer's patients. He's published about 98, I think, case studies now. Okay? now he went to get funding for a research trial. Right? And his approach is, is you know, lifestyle that I outline is, is that's the core of it, and there's, a, there's quite a few add-ons as well to it. Because this stuff really changes your biology. We don't realize how powerful it is. He couldn't get research funding for his trials. He said, well, hold on a minute, you're changing more than one parameter. He goes, yeah, that's the point. I'm changing eight parameters. That's why I'm getting good results. And they say, well, we can't do a trial. So the problem is the whole system is set up to look at this, you know, and but I, 
I, I'm sure we're looking for newer solutions, and I absolutely would welcome the chance. I'm aware. To have a I all of them have got healthcare po uh, company before, and uh, I developed the psychological treatment. We can give private private money to do all this research, and we can show that it's more effective. Brilliant. Well, let's have a chat afterwards. Love to. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to the other question over there, Adam. The lady had her hand up in the blue top. I think. Oh, you got a microphone. Yeah. Hi there. Hello. Um, I just wanted to collaborate with you a little bit on the first question you've answered. Um, and you talked about everything that you as a, a health practitioner is doing. And my reflection on that was that when we go, that we as patients are part of the problem. And when we go to a GP, we put ourselves and our health and our well-being in the hands of this one person, expecting him to be this all knowing fountain of knowledge and expecting a magical pill to solve our problems. And my take on it uh, from personal experience is that, and, and it's just something that I wanted to say, is that I uh, can take responsibility for my own health and work with a practitioner and if he doesn't resonate with me and with the way that I see my health should be sort of directed, I can always go somewhere else and find other resources. There's just, you know, coming from a proactive place and being, um, taking responsibility for my own health. Uh, and I think that if we all did that, and then having the guidance of great practitioners who sort of steer us on the right path, that's kind of a win-win solution. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, thanks for that. I mean, that's a great point. And because this isn't just about doctors doing this or the public, it has to come from all angles. But, but on, on a wider scale of personal responsibility, right, and this is, a, this is quite a big societal issue, I fundamentally do not believe that any one of us want to be unhealthy. We don't want to be living well. There's so many complex reasons as to why we make the choices that we make. Emotions and stress behind the scenes playing a big, big role there. So if... You know, I don't think we can put it all down to personal responsibility because, look, all these modern healthcare systems are, are literally going bankrupt. The NHS is creaking at the seams. We can't just keep putting it on personal responsibility, right? That's important, definitely. And, of course, my book is about trying to help inspire people and educate them so that they can take that personal responsibility. But on a wider scale, we need to make it easier for people to make those healthy choices. I'll tell you, the, I, I, I detail... Um, have you heard of the Blue Zones? Yeah. yeah, so Blue Zones, for those of you who don't know, are these five uh, sort of, I think there's only five so far. They're looking into do any other regions qualify. And, you know, there are these areas around the world where they've got high rates of longevity and people are living you know, past 100 in really good health. And clearly, scientists have studied them and go, what's the magic? What's the magic diet? Actually, they all eat different diets, right? Some are vegetarian, some are eating quite a lot of meat. What's common in their diets is that they're all minimally processed. They're all local and seasonal, right? They're all generally home cooked. That's the commonality. But also, you look at the other components of their lifestyle, they're all physically active, not because they go to the gym, because of the way they live their lives <coughs> is physically active. They're not on a car, they're getting their shopping delivered to their door. I mean, when in evolutionary history we ever managed to get food as easily as we do now? And I use a cardio, right? So I'm not, again, it's not about criticizing. I mean, I recognize it, right? They're all well slept. They're all under stress. And when we are examining them, it's a lifestyle. It's not just the diet. It's not just their movement patterns. It's the whole thing. And what we're looking, what's that blue zone diet? It ain't, there ain't one, Right? And that's, that's, that's why it's so synonymous with what I, the principles I try and put out. It's, it's this holistic approach to health. And it all factors in, you know, together. I, in June, right, I was in Guernsey. I was speaking at something called the Live to 100 conference. And I was very fortunate to meet the guy called Michel Poulain. He's the Belgian researcher who coined the term Blue Zones. And, and we went around meeting some of Guernsey's centenarians. It was a remarkable experience. We were in a cab. We got around to the house. And I'm used to doing home visits as a GP. And clearly the people I see generally are unwell and need of a doctor. So I don't think anyone has ever opened their door to me past the age of 100. Don't, not that I can recall. But we knocked on this door. And this, this chap, 102-year-old chap, comes to the door. And he, he opens it and he lets us in. <laughs> he 
Again, we sit down, he makes us a cup of tea. I'm like, this is, this is just incredible. So we're having a conversation. And I said, well, look, you know, you know, tell me about your life. And, you know, he's always grown his own food. Right? He's got an allotment. He's always walked every day to get it. I spoke to him about stress. He's like, stress? no, I love my life. Um, and then he talks about this. I can't remember the name of it. It's this gorgeous treat. It's, it's a mix between, like, um, like, some sweet bread and a croissant. I think it's a Guernsey <laughs> delicacy. <coughs> I said, God, I love that. I said, oh, yeah, how often do you have that? You're having it every day? You're having it every weekend? He goes, oh, no. Every Easter and Christmas, that's it. Never have it every day. Right? And it was just incredible. And I thought, and he actually also said, until I was 97, I never saw a doctor. And since when I said, that's when my health started going downhill. I found that remarkable. <laughs> now, clearly, you know, there, there's many factors to consider there. But his whole lifestyle, he didn't think about health. Health was the default option. Right? And I think that's one of the problems we've got in society. It's not the default option anymore. The default option is to be sedentary, is to be underslept, is to be overstressed, is to eat junk. But right? we bring it upon ourselves. And that's kind of my point is, you know, just we've got control over the environment in which we live. And, uh, you know, part of this is to take, you know, part of this responsibility on ourselves and... Uh, you know, and, and you as a GP take the responsibility and, and I guess then we've got this collaboration, you know. I, I guess that's what I would like to see more, a collaboration between patients and doctors about um, the best way forward for that yeah. particular individual. I, I totally agree with you, right? And I never see my job as a doctor to tell someone what to do. It's always a partnership. It's always a, a conversation about, does this resonate with you? Is this something you might be able to do? Do you think that's what you want to do? Right? So I agree. I guess I'm talking from a doctor's perspective. Right? I think we can do more as a profession than we currently are doing. Even though I know I've got some, I know some, some doctors say I think we are. Every doctor I know is doing their best for their patients with the training they've been given and the system they're working in. There's no question I'm incredibly proud to be a doctor. But I've also seen that actually we need a bigger toolkit now to deal with the patients that we're seeing today. Right? And that's what I'm keen to promote. And I would like more doctors to be open to having these conversations with patients who are proactive about their health. But you know what? I'll tell you one thing that has changed my view. I worked for seven years in Oldham, right? a very deprived, you know, very, you know, very uh, uh, deprived practice with, with patients on benefits and poor income levels. And I could give them the best lifestyle advice that I could possibly give them in those 10 minutes. And they were walking out into a food landscape where it was damn difficult for them to make healthy food choices. Right, if I ever forgot my lunch there, if I wanted to go out and buy a healthy lunch, you know, there were kebab shops, fried chicken shops, £1.49, eat as much as you want. Hey, I'm incredibly motivated about health. That's what I stand for, right? Not everyone is, right? And if you're on low income and you see that as a way of feeding your family, and this is, so this is a much wider societal issue, I think, I don't think it's as quite as straightforward. Yes, personal responsibility is important. Medical profession getting on board important. Hospitals getting rid of junk food important. All of it's important bit by bit. So, yeah, I do, in general, I do agree with what you're saying. It's a great point. Thank you so much. Right, okay, let's take a couple more questions and we have to wrap up. So, there's a lady here with her hand up and then we'll go to the, um, the one behind Alan, the camera there, with, uh, with the scarf on. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I meant this lady here. Um, thank you, yeah. Yeah, great. Sorry, it was you. Hi, um, thank you very much for this Hello. presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question related to the eat part. Um, I'm a dietetic student, so I come from a... You know, I, ha I have read quite a lot on the research behind it. So I understood you said there is only limited research on the uh, limiting your intake within 12 hours. Um, in humans. In humans. In humans. Hopefully we'll get more research on that in the next few years. Um, personally, I find it a bit of a reductionist approach to limit your intake in 12 hours. Um, I wanted to hear about um, your opinion on intuitive eating, which is a slightly different principle to restricting your intake in 12 hours, but there is quite a lot of research. Yeah, so I've got to say, I don't know a huge amount about intuitive eating, okay, but there's a few people I follow on Instagram who I'm seeing talking about it, so I'm very interested to learn more. Uh, no question. The thing I'll tell you about 12-hour eating, right? I'm giving, it, what I give to people, 
right? What I do with my patients is what evidence-based medicine is, right? And here's the problem with what people, particularly a lot of junior people, I now see talking about health in the health space. They think evidence-based medicine is about the research paper. It's not. Evidence-based medicine is a combination of three things. Professor Sackett, the godfather of evidence-based medicine, has a beautiful BMJ article, British Medical Journal article in 1997, and he details it. It's three things. It's research evidence, it's patient preference, and it's clinical expertise, and it's where those three things intersect. That's what evidence-based medicine is. No research paper out there tells me what to do with a patient in front of me. It guides me, but it never can tell me exactly the ins and outs of that particular person, right? And when you've got an intervention, a 12-hour eating window, there is zero downside, right, for the majority of my patients, right? There is zero downside, right? It makes sense intuitively on an evolutionary level. Are we, do we feel that we're designed to eat constantly from morning to late at night? A trial came out last year, 30% of us have a genetic, uh, a genetic SNP, whereby we cannot release insulin. So insulin is a hormone that manages a lot of the food that we eat, very simplistically. Right? In the presence of melatonin, which is our sleep hormone, we can't release insulin for 30% for of us, or it's limited. But if you think about that on an evolutionary level, of course that makes sense. Why, when our melatonin levels are high and we would be sleeping, right? would we actually have the functionality to release something to manage food, right? So I'm very comfortable making that recommendation on limited human studies because it makes sense to me. I see no downside. And, you know, I think it's a common sense intervention that I've seen change the health of many people. Now, if a patient says, that, what, that isn't for me, right? And I've got 20 suggestions. And I don't, say, I don't expect anyone to do all 20. If that ain't the one that appeals to you, don't do it. <coughs> Do a different one. And that's the point of this. It's about people personalizing it for them. So, I, you know, I, I, I think you, you make a really good point. I'd love to learn more about intuitive eating because I'm always very happy to admit when I don't know about something. And if that's something, um, you know, I'd love, if we get a chance, I'd love you to share some of, you know, what intuitive eating is. But if it is what I think it might be, right, just from the name, I think that the principles that I try and outline get people more in touch with the way that they feel so that they make the choices that they feel they want to make. I feel at the moment when we're, for many of us, because of the way we live, when we're stressed, we're having junk food all the time, we're not in tune with our bodies. We're not in tune with what our bodies are calling out for. And I, I, what I, my goal with every patient is to try and get them in tune so that they're empowered to make those decisions. So anyway, I hope that clarifies some so, of it. So Ranga, just on that note, one thing we talk about a lot in Action for Happiness events is mindfulness and living mindfully. And it strikes me that what you're doing with your work is sort of helping people wake up and make more conscious choices over what you eat, when you sleep, what you're doing. So whether that's about intuitive behavior, whether it's about just being, instead of sort of on autopilot, sticking crisps down your mouth while watching television or, you know, looking at your phone by default, it's sort of waking up and saying, why am I doing this? And I think that's why it's so powerful. Now, I've got a couple of important announcements I'd like to make before we close. But I did promise to let one more question, and then we'll, we'll obviously then show our appreciation to Rangan. So this lady over here had her hand up. And apologies to those of you who haven't had a chance. Rangan has very kindly agreed to stay behind for a little bit to um, do a few signings and so on. So hopefully you might still have a chance to say hello. Last question. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks so much. It's been a really interesting hello. Pre hello <laughs> presentation. And wanted to quickly ask about um, inflammatory um, diseases, and just in terms of would this work for those sorts of kind of chronic illnesses. I've got kind of two um, people quite close to me. One has a kind of very serious kind of chronic um, lung com condition, which is off work for, and then another one is with arthritis, osteoarthritis. Both have been told it's kind of always oh, just painkillers now and there's not much they can do. Would this help reverse any of it, or is it kind of, has it got too far? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's really difficult to answer without yeah, knowing maybe. the ins and outs of it, but in general... My experience has been that this kind of approach can help certainly improve things, right? How far? It really depends how advanced it is. That's, that's absolutely for sure. Um, so I wouldn't want to make any, any sort of promise to you re regarding your friends or your family who, who've got this condition. But look, if we're talking about inflammation in the body, right? And we know now that, well, a lot of modern science is telling us that chronic inflammation 
is actually at the root cause of many of the different diseases and inflammatory diseases we're now seeing. Well, a lot of that inflammation starts in our gut, right? So everything that I try to do is, and I talk a lot about inflammation in the book, is how we reduce levels of chronic inflammation. This plan will, for many people, help reduce levels of chronic inflammation, right? So if that is a factor in their condition, it could help improve it. If it isn't, it possibly wouldn't. Does that make sense? But it, it, is, it is remarkable. I use this approach with all of my patients as a baseline, right? And off, it's amazing the stories you sometimes hear back. Thank you for all your questions. And uh, before I make a couple of final announcements, please join me in giving Rangan so much thanks.